Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining me today for Sundays at Home, a time for conversation, camaraderie, and discovering more about the women who have helped shape our world but have been largely underrepresented in our historical narrative. My name is Emma Rothberg, and I'm the Associate Educator of Digital Learning and Innovation at the National Women's History Museum. Not only am I your host for today, but I am also your presenter. For those of you who are with us for the first time, welcome. For those of you who have attended an NWHM event, before, welcome back and thank you for your continued support. The National Women's History Museum exists to preserve, illuminate, and share the powerful history of women in America, highlighting both the past and present. NWHM seeks to ensure that women's history is available and accessible to learners of all ages across the globe. Before we begin, please allow me to go over a few housekeeping items. This presentation is being recorded and will be available on the museum's YouTube channel in the days following the event. I will be available to answer your questions at the end of the presentation, so please use the Q&A feature on the tool ribbon to ask any questions that you may regarding the presentation. You may submit your questions at any time. You are also welcome to use the chat feature if you have any comments throughout the program. I will do my best to read them as I share my screen. So I want you to take a minute and think about your answers to the following questions, and if you'd like to share your answers in the chat, you are also welcome. Do you enjoy parades? What was the last parade that you went to? What was the first parade you remember attending? What parades do you know happen regularly in your community? When you think about parades, do you think about them as being celebratory events or protest events? Can they be both? Many of us have memories of attending a parade, whether they be a smaller hometown affair filled with local people and businesses who you know and recognize, or larger civic events that seem to traverse an entire city. Parades have come to symbolize, for many, a time of celebration. Particularly around the July 4th holiday, many of us think of parades as tied to celebration. Today, I wanna to focus on a potentially less well-known type of parading, namely those that played a central and important role in the women's suffrage movement, which fought for a woman's right to vote. This topic of, the topic of today's talk, women's suffrage parades, is near and dear to my heart. I recently received my PhD in history from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. My dissertation focused on how parades reflected important discussions around citizenship and democracy at the turn of the 19th century. One chapter was devoted exclusively to suffrage parades, so I'm really excited to walk you through NWHM's amazing exhibit, Parading for Progress, and explore how women use parading in the streets to further the cause of equal citizenship during the suffrage movement. These parades, including the one in Washington, D.C. in 1913 that we will focus on today, were moments of both celebration and protest, celebrating women, their accomplishments, and their dedication to their communities while simultaneously protesting their second-class status and less than full citizenship rights. The right to assembly is enshrined in the First Amendment. Parading is a form of assembly. By taking to the streets, women were making claims on that citizenship. They were claiming full and equal citizenship for themselves. So now going to share my screen so you can all see this exhibit. So the 1913 Women's Suffrage Parade through Washington, D.C. completely changed the way protests were viewed and carried out by the American public. Thousands of women took to the streets to fight for their right to vote. The, their parade from the U.S. Capitol to the Treasury Building set the precedent for future protest marches. The 1913 Women's Suffrage Parade in Washington, D.C., unprecedented in both its scale and its tactics, was a major turning point for the women's suffrage movement in the United States. Suffrage leader Alice Paul, who was recently elected head of the National American Women's Suffrage Association's Congressional Committee, devised the idea for a large-scale public demonstration. Paul, who had spent time in England, witnessed the more militant tactics that the British suffragettes used to draw attention to their cause. Applying what she had learned in England, Paul decided a massive parade perfectly timed with President-elect Woodrow Wilson's inauguration would capitalize on the thousands of people gathered in the city. While the Washington DC parade may be the most famous and tied to British tactics, the parade also built on a tradition of urban parading, including a tradition of parading for suffrage rights. I also wanna talk about that tradition in New York, which had massive parades in the lead up to 1913 today. Up until these suffrage parades at the beginning of the 20th century, 
Parades historically were overwhelmingly male affairs. The military, fraternal organizations, and labor unions, all overwhelmingly or exclusively male at the turn of the century, used parades time and time again in cities across the United States. Women's suffrage parades were some of the first parades in which women paraded as themselves. First, let me give a brief overview of the women's suffrage movement up until the 1913 parade we're going to focus on today. During the mid 1800s, female abolitionists began drawing parallels between the condition of the enslaved population and their own condition as prisoners within a patriarchal society. Drawing on this sentiment, women's rights activists, Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Lucretia Mott organized a convention in Seneca Falls, New York in 1848, during which they advocated for female suffrage. The Seneca Falls Convention is recognized as the beginning of the women's suffrage movement in the United States. At Seneca Falls, the gathered women debated what they wanted to include in their declaration of sentiments. Not all agreed that the vote was essential for women's equality. While they agreed to include it, it was the most controversial of the asks, which included education, property rights, and others for women. Oh my, there we go. After the Seneca Falls Convention, suffragists employed numerous strategies to gain support for their cause. Suffrage organizations distributed newspapers and handouts like this one, explaining how female enfranchisement would benefit society. They also hosted lectures in private clubs and homes. In the 19th century, the suffrage movement was a fairly domestic one, meaning many of its sponsored events were inside. This was a tactical choice that was tied to contemporary ideas of femininity and that a woman's place was in the home. As the suffrage movement moved outside, suffrage advocates had to confront and deal with these expectations of femininity. Not all women, however, supported the suffrage movement. Some considered politics masculine and thought women should stick to a more feminine domestic role. Many men also felt that, that a woman's place was in the home and they had no business being in the public political sphere. This strain of thinking still pops up today in terms of expectations for what women should and should not do and in politics. So looking at this cartoon that you can see on the screen, how do you think it, the cartoon depicts femininity and the idea of the domestic sphere? I would point to the inclusion of particular objects or people as symbols of common ideas of a woman's place and role at the turn of the century. So the infant in the stroller, the fashion doll, the top with gossip written on it, and most importantly, the fence marked woman's sphere, which literally confines the woman and prevents her from fully seeing the rest of the world beyond the fence, something she obviously wants to do since she is peering over it. But why are these symbols important? Do you think the cartoonist was supportive or not of the idea of a woman's sphere? I would argue, particularly in the lower cartoon, that the cartoonist was supportive of women voting. The women are drawn as feminine, caring mothers who are able to maintain their feminine roles while voting. Notice the clothing, the fact that women in the front keeps her hand on the stroller as she puts a ballot in the, in the ballot box. Cartoons that were less supportive of women voting would use caricature or depict women's suffrage advocates as more masculine or as bad mothers as a way of discrediting them. These cartoons don't do that. Like these cartoons, suffragists had a response to those who wanted them to be quiet and stay home. They argued that the home was part of the larger community. Thus, it was their duty to participate in politics. This idea of municipal housekeeping and that women would clean up and moralize politics in the same ways they cleaned up and moralized the home was a powerful idea. It was one that allowed women to meet the expectations of femininity and feminine roles while carving out a socially acceptable way and language to enter the political and public sphere. Now, many of the women who were navigating the public and private spheres as they advocated for women's suffrage were members of large suffrage organizations. These organizations had different tactics for achieving their goal of extending the ability to vote to women. Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony founded the National Women's Suffrage Association, the NWSA, first in 1869. The pair believed that instead of supporting the 15th Amendment, which granted African-American men the right to vote, women's rights activists should fight for the women to be included as well. The NWSA wanted a constitutional amendment to secure the vote for women, 
but it also supported a variety of reforms that aimed to make women equal members of society. The second national suffrage organization established 1869 was the American Women's Suffrage Association, or the AWSA. Unlike the rival NWSA, the AWSA supported the 15th Amendment that granted African-American men the right to vote. Despite the movement's continuous growth after the convention at Seneca Falls, not all women were or felt welcomed in it. The mostly white movement often discriminated against black women working towards the same goal. And while the AWSA supported the 15th Amendment, the NWSA did not because it neglected women. In 1890, both organizations merged to form the National American Women's Suffrage Association, or NASA, which sought the vote for all American women. In the 1880s, Black reformers began organizing their own groups. In 1896, they founded the National Association of Colored Women, which became the largest federation of local Black women's clubs. Their motto was lifting as we climb. They advocated for women's rights as well as to uplift and improve the status of African Americans. Even though most Black men officially won the right to vote in 1870, impossible literacy tests, high poll taxes, and grandfather clauses prevented many of them from casting their ballots. In spite of the discrimination against them, some women of color became prominent in the suffrage movement, such as Mary Church Terrell, who's pictured here, who was president of the NACW, again, the National Association of Colored Women, and Adelina Otero Warren, who played a major role in New Mexico's ratification of the 19th Amendment, including promoting the inclusion of Spanish language materials for those whose who English was not their first language. In 1890, the NWSA and the AWSA united to form the National American Women's Suffrage Association, combining their efforts to work towards suffrage. I want to take a minute to look closely at this image that's up on the screen, particularly the three women in white and the advertisement on the wagon. The photo is from 1914 and depicts an advertisement for the National Women's Suffrage Association. The slogan, first, last, always, is written in large letters and pictures of Susan B. Anthony on the left, and Anna Howard Shaw on the right are prominent. Anthony was the first president of, of, of NASA, the National American Women's Suffrage Association, and Shaw was still serving as president of, of NASA at the time of this photo. She was first elected in 1904. The women in, in white in front of the wagon wear what many now refer to as suffered white. Suffragists chose white for two main reasons. One, advertising. It would help them stand out in the black and white photos that were being more and more readily printed in newspapers. They wouldn't literally fade into the background if they were wearing dark clothing in the black and white photo. The second reason was that the color white was, and still is, associated with purity. A woman demanded to be recognized as full and equal citizens with full and equal rights. They still wanted to present themselves as respectable, dignified women. White clothing helped aid that argument. For decades, suffragists worked hard to, to earn the right to vote. Constitutional amendments for women's suffrage were proposed to Congress in 1869 and every year between 1878 and 1920. In the 1890s, NASA developed a state-by-state -state strategy, earning women in Wyoming, Utah, Idaho, and Colorado the vote by 1896. However, little progress was made between 1896 and 1913 until the March on Washington galvanized the women's suffrage movement and helped lead to the, to the passage of the 19th Amendment in 1920. But DC's parade was certainly not the first. Suffrage parades first began in New York City due in large part to the urging of one woman. Harriet Stanton Blatch, the daughter of Elizabeth Cady Stanton, who was one of the leaders of the suffrage movement in the 19th century, had spent time in England and was inspired by the suffrage parades she saw there. She was also tired of the fact that, quote, the suffrage movement was completely in a rut in New York State at the opening of the 20th century, since it, quote, bored its adherents and repelled its opponents. She wrote in her memoir, Challenging Years, that, quote, convinced as I was that mankind is moved to action by emotion, not by argument and reason, I saw the possibilities in a suffrage parade 
end quote. New York was a particularly important state in the campaign for women's suffrage since it was so large and influential. If New York voted to allow women to vote, it would help convince many other states and Congress to pass women's suffrage legislation. Yet the initial calls for a suffrage parade were controversial. Many women were fearful that marching through the streets would undermine their claims to femininity and virtue, two claims that were central to their arguments for the vote. The streets, it was believed, were not a place for respectable women. Despite the fact that many women moved through the streets to shop or to go to work every single day. Carrie Chapman Catt, who was the head of NASA when these suffrage parades were first starting to get proposed, also came out against the parade as she preferred more private tactics and persuasion of individual lawmakers. Blatch and others were not deterred by the pushback. A parade was a bold way of trampling on longstanding views of women's public vulnerability. New York City had its first sponsored suffrage parade in 1910. In 1911, approximately 5,000 women marched down Fifth Avenue in Manhattan. In 1912, the parade was even larger. This photo that you see now, courtesy of the National Archives and Records Administration, is of a suffrage parade in Manhattan in 1912. Notice the women dressed in cap and gown in black at the front of the parade, kind of down by the right of the screen. She represents university women, an almost constant inclusion in suffrage parades because they promoted women's education while simultaneously showcasing women's roles and abilities to work outside of the home. Also notice the crowds, they are orderly and interested. And the fact that these women literally stopped traffic, which you can kind of see by the fact that all of those trolleys in the back can't go anywhere. These women had a permit to march. And this parade is already large, and this photo shows only a small portion of that parade. But these New York City parades would get significantly larger as the years went on. So notice in this photo, courtesy of the Library of Congress, which is also the Manhattan Suffrage Parade in 1912, that the women are marching as suffragists and mothers. The child in the stroller in front, known as the youngest suffragist um, in the photo caption, is prominently featured not only in the march, but in the documentation of the parade. This is how the women wanted to be remembered, as respectful women and mothers who wanted the vote to care for their children. This is a strategic argument that these women are making, and it's promoting it through this imagery. Not all women agreed with this tactic of promoting themselves as highly, highly feminized women and, high, and mothers, but many, many did, and this is some of the dominant imagery that you see in suffrage parades. So the 1915 suffrage parade in Manhattan, which this photo is of, included over 20,000 marching women. This photo is from the Library of Congress and it kind of gets at the vastness of this 1915 parade. You can't see the start or the end of it in this photo. So when we get to the planning of the 1913 parade, it's not happening in a vacuum. There was precedent from Britain and other US suffrage parades and that women had started to move their suffrage activism into the public areas, including the streets. Parade organizers strategically selected March 3rd, 1913 for the march. Woodrow Wilson was to be inaugurated as the new president the following day and national press would be in town and idle awaiting the inaugural festivities. Other parades and marches have used important events such as inaugurations as a way to get attention. If you can think of some, Put them in the chat. City officials tried to route the parade down 16th Street away from the city's core. Alice Paul insisted that it would march down Pennsylvania Avenue, deliberately following the same route that the inaugural parade would take the next day. The contrast between the two parades would prove striking. Reporters flocked to the suffered parade, leaving Wilson to arrive at the train station unheralded. When Paul began to organize a national suffrage parade, a key component of her plan was to channel media attention towards women's voting rights. Paul had firsthand experience with British suffragettes' use of pageantry and knew that New York suffragists had staged spectacular parades down Fifth Avenue in the prior three years, which we've talked about and seen those images. These savvy women knew that street spectacle drew attention to their cause. The parade was choreographed to be highly photogenic in part to capitalize on the fact that newspapers now more regularly printed images. The parade was 
led by human rights lawyer Inez Mulholland astride a white horse pictured here. She was dressed as Joan of Arc. Joan is a favorite icon for the American suffrage movement because she represented to suffragists a woman fighting the good fight against men who sought to oppress her, though admittedly suffragists did ignore her eventual torture and execution. That Joan of Arc was historically removed from the 20th century suffrage movement made her image less threatening to men, it was believed. Women in medieval style armor did not evoke the same gendered fears as if women paraded in more contemporary military uniforms. Jones appeared in many suffrage parades, including those in Baltimore, New York City, Philadelphia, and Boston. So notice how Inez stands out in this photo. What is she wearing? White clothing. She's also on a white horse. Again, suffragists were incredibly media savvy and understood the best way to make an impact, both in person and on the printed page. The parade included nine bands, four mounted brigades, more than 20 floats, and around 8,000 marchers. The first contingent dressed in national costume represented countries whose governments had enfranchised women. Partly this inclusion was an attempt to show the United States that it lagged behind. Many suffragists argued it was a way of shaming the United States into doing what they should be doing, which is enfranchising women. This newspaper drawing, I think, tries to give a sense of the scope, length, and absolute spectacle of the parade. The drawing almost seems to go off the page, giving a sense of how overwhelming the event was, much like that photo of the 1915 parade we looked at earlier. You can't make out the individuals at the top of the drawing, which I think is an interesting way of getting at the idea of the masses and the sheer number of women who participated and supported the parade and its purpose. So I'm going to now share some footage from suffrage parades. The first clip shows unidentified suffrage parades and the second is of the 1913 DC parade. Please note that both of these clips have no sound. And here's the second clip of the DC parade itself. So as you can see in those clips and as you see in this picture, women represented a variety of backgrounds and, and jobs and professions, including university women, homemakers, librarians, and nurses. All of them wore symbolic garb. And all of these groups showcased the multiple ways in which women supported and were part of the larger world. They were not sequestered in their homes, like that earlier cartoon with the woman fenced in. They were out and about. They were fully active in a society that did not grant them full and equal rights. Women from all over the United States and abroad traveled to Washington, D.C. to participate in the march. Alice Paul, working with Mary Church Terrell, allowed African-American women to participate, but they had to march in the back of the parade, which again kind of symbolizes this tension between the women's suffrage movement and the idea of who they were really fighting for to get the vote. There was a lot of racial tension, and unfortunately, the women's suffrage movement trafficked in white supremacist ideology, language, and rhetoric throughout its time. So prominent civil rights activists and suffragists Ida B. Wells Barnett, who is pictured here, 
didn't agree with the decision to have African-American women join the parade at the end. While she started in the back, she ran to the front once the parade began to join the women in her state's delegation. So exclusion, as I was saying, is unfortunately a reality of parades. Taking a roster for the parade is a series of choices and people and groups are either consciously or unconsciously left out. Certain more contemporary parades have faced controversy over who is included or excluded in their rosters as well. So let me ask you this question. If you had to organize a parade, who would you include and who wouldn't you include? Sometimes those planning questions can be really difficult to answer. The parade's drama was heightened by the crowd's crass behavior. Marchers were subjected to insults and physical attacks by many of the half million largely male spectators. Police stood idly by while the women were assaulted. The press captured dramatic images of the event and distributed them to newspaper readers across the country. Eventually, the parade made it to its final destination, the steps of the Treasury Building. And we have a contemporary photo from Google, Google Maps um, picturing the, the Treasury Building up on the screen. So these women performed an allegorical tableau where women stood motionless, representing scenes from history on the steps of the building. And here is a photo of one of those, those tableaus, my apologies. While women for centuries have been figures of allegory, often cast in the roles of muse, the tableau at the 1913 parade challenged these notions of femininity. Women were dressed in classical attire, stressing grace and beauty while also arguing for their rights as women. Apologize, the photo is not loading. I apologize if the photo is not loading. Women had dressed as liberty and freedom or as historical figures in other parades, but rarely participated as their contemporary selves. Suffrage parades had women in both allegorical and contemporary roles. Women were not symbols. They were living, breathing people in this parade as they should be in life and in the law. Despite the chaos and violence that initially ensued during the parade, Paul declared the event a success. The parade made national headlines and once again captured the public's interest in the suffrage movement. The parade and the crowd's behavior, which included men rushing the parade, breaking it up, trying to pull women off floats, drew attention to the suffragist cause. Readers were appalled to learn of the attacks and the police inaction. Even those who opposed votes for women acknowledged that as citizens, the women had the right to peacefully assemble. That right had been abridged when their parade was broken up and the police did very little, if nothing, to stop people from running in and trying to break up the parade. So the United States Senate held hearings to investigate the police response, eventually leading to the chief's resignation. The hearings kept the women's cause in the media spotlight for months to come. Alice Paul and her supporters built upon their success by staging protests in front of the White House. They created media-friendly opportunities to keep their message front and center for the American public. Um, and this is a photo of the White House pickets, which became very, very famous or infamous, depending on how you want to categorize their actions. Paul wanted suffragists to organize more parades and protests to get the public's attention. She hoped this strategy would help secure the passage of a federal suffrage amendment. The end of NA, the National Association of Women's Suffrage, National American Women's Suffrage Association, my apologies, the acronym sometimes get me, however, opposed these militant tactics. Its leaders preferred state by state campaigns and traditional methods like petitioning legislatures and lobbying politicians individually. Soon after the parade, militant suffragists under Paul's leadership broke away from NASA and founded the Congressional Union. In 1917, they renamed their group the National Women's Party. While protests at the White House seem common today, the National Women's Party organized the first picket in January 1917. Through the cold and rain, suffragists with banners stood at President Woodrow Wilson's gates on and off throughout the year. Even as the United States entered World War I, the National Women's Party continued to picket in front of the White House. Their choice angered politicians and some of the public who believed the pickets were unpatriotic. 
In, in fact, many of these women were arrested and thrown into a workhouse located in Virginia. Um, Alice Paul then used this as additional media, ways of getting additional media attention. Um, and it turned out to be quite the coup for those who were, who were arrested um, and it brought even more attention to their cause. So the combination of NASA's war efforts and the publicity attracted by the National Women's Party pickets at the White House led to widespread support for women's suffrage. Although President Woodrow Wilson previously had refused to endorse suffrage, in September 1918, he addressed the Senate in favor of votes for women. He appealed to patriotic arguments for suffrage when he asked representatives, quote, we've made partners of the women in this war, shall we admit them only to a partnership of suffering and sacrifice and toil and not to a partnership of privilege and right? The 19th Amendment to the US Constitution states, quote, the right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on an account of sex. Congress passed the amendment in June, 1919. The National American Women's Suffrage Association and the National Women's Party suffragists lobbied local and state representatives to ensure its subsequent ratification by the states. The image on the screen is of the gold fountain pen used by both Vice President Thomas Marshall and Speaker of the House Frederick Gillette on June 4th, 1919 to sign the joint resolution of Congress recommending a constitutional amendment extending the right of suffrage to women. Harry Byrne, a young representative from Neota, Tennessee, passed the deciding vote to ratify the 19th Amendment. His yes vote, encouraged by a letter from his mother, broke a tie and caused Tennessee to become the 36th state to ratify the 19th Amendment, making it law. After the ratification of the 19th Amendment on August 18, 1920, female activists continued to use politics to reform society. NASA became the League of Women Voters. In 1923, the National Women's Party proposed the Equal Rights Amendment, or the ERA, to ban discrimination based on sex. The League of Women Voters and efforts to pass the ERA continue today. So this image up on the screen is one of several charm bracelets started by Alice Paul in 1972, symbolizing the states that have voted to ratify the ERA. The 1913 Women's Suffrage Parade set a precedent for future large-scale demonstrations in the nation's capital. Although it was not the first large-scale demonstration on the capital, a demonstration by laborers in 1894 to protest what they saw was a, not enough government action to address the 1893 depression, um, which was known as Coxey's Army predates the 1913 parade, but its size, scope, and influence set a new tone. More than 250,000 people gathered in Washington, D.C. on August 28, 1963 for a political rally known as the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom. Organized by civil rights and religious organizations, it was designed to illuminate the political and social challenges confronting African Americans. The march, which became a key moment in the growing struggle for civil rights, culminated in Martha, Martin Luther King Jr.'s I Have a Dream speech, a spirited call for racial justice and equality. Even more recently, the January 21st, 2017 Women's March followed the legacy of the 1913 suffrage parade using pageantry and symbolism to garner media attention. Many women wore suffrage sashes honoring the suffragists that marched before them and pink hats as a sign of solidarity. And obviously marching to uh, or having parades, organizing parades around the Capitol still continues and there have been subsequent women's marches since this one in 2017. The 1913 Women's Suffrage Parade through Washington, D.C. had a lasting impact on political and social demonstrations in the United States. These courageous women set a precedent encouraging future generations to stand up and fight for what they believe in. So I hope I have left you with a better understanding of the history and legacy of the right to assemble and how women have used parades to fight and stand up for their rights. I'm looking forward to answering your questions. Uh, please put them in the Q&A box. I will stop sharing my screen.
So thank you again for, for joining me this afternoon. Um, I really appreciate all of your time and your questions. So one of the questions that has come in is if I could talk more about the ways in which women were involved in politics before the 19th Amendment. So thank you for this question. It's really fabulous. I, I do want to make it very clear uh, that women's, women's suffrage was not even the first time that some women could vote in the United States. Um, actually, starting in the 1790s, just after the United States becomes the United States, after the American Revolution, property women had the right to vote in New Jersey. That was written initially into the state legislature, or sorry, written into their state um, constitution by the legislature. It was a rule, and it actually gets taken away. Um, they start, uh, the New Jersey stops kind of enforcing that right. It starts whittling away at property women and people of color's um, right to vote. But eventually that, that's taken off the books and it's then not until 1920 um, that you have you know, all um, the entire country allowing women to vote. I also wanna point out that we had a kind of patchwork law system that was going on in the United States before the 19th amendment. So while some women like those in Wyoming had the right to vote at all levels, other women were granted the right to vote in things like school board elections um, or for other education related uh, votes, because again, if that idea, that correlation between a woman's proper place and proper role taking care of children and the fact that therefore she should have a say in how schools were run, because it has to do with children's education. Um, but beyond the vote, women were also involved in political parties. Um, they could support um, their husbands. They could be involved in political rallies. Um, their role as they're, they're, um, many of them were used in the role of allegory um, in order to create um, advertising for specific candidates. So women were directly involved um, in politics and in uh, you know, political parties and, and, and that kind of thing, even if they did not actually have the right to vote. Um, so that is, that is important to remember. So another question is how many women worked outside the home at the turn of the century? Uh, again, this is a really good question. I don't have an exact number for you, but it is a growing percentage of women who are working. Um, not only do you have many women who are working in um, as laborers, as day laborers, if you think about um, you know, the kind of infamous sweatshops in New York City, um, the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire in 19, 1911, um, that kills over 100 women who get trapped inside of the sweatshop. Um, so you have women who are, who are doing uh, that work in kind of factories. You have in the South in particular, many African-American women who are working as um, domestic laborers. They are working, um, they own their own laundries and they're working in laundries. Um, you have many women who are serving as teachers, women who are becoming nurses. Women are out in the workforce. They are moving around. So the idea that there is a quote unquote woman's sphere and that women belong in the home is based off of a kind of middle and upper class white idea of women's proper, proper spaces. But you can only achieve that if one, you want to achieve that. And two, if you have the support of working women and um, and other marginalized women to support you in running a household, right? I mean, if you if you are a middle class woman who's able to say, well, I can focus all of my attention on keeping my house, you know, kind of clean and safe, it means you probably have someone who's watching your children or going out and doing your shopping. It's also to say it's not just work that is taking women out of the home. Um, Department stores are starting to emerge at the at the turn of the century, or becoming much well much more established by the turn of the century. And women are shopping; they're they're going they are going to those department stores. They are buying things. They are going out to be seen. And you have a lot of tension in the ways in which um, you know cities are trying to organize themselves. Right? Are the streets for walking and um, are the streets for those who want to shop, you know, commercial activities, or are they for moving goods around, right, the more kind of industrial activities. There's actually really interesting um, debates that are happening in Chicago at the turn of the century about this, 
Um, so it's, it's not just working women who are moving around in public space. It's, it's also upper class women who are kind of pushing back and they're, and they're flexing their muscles to see how, how can they, they can kind of maneuver around these expectations that they belong in the home while still maintaining their femininity. It's really fascinating. So thank you for that question. All right. So another question was, what was the first suffrage parade in the United States? So many consider the first suffrage parade in the United States to have happened in 1908 in New York City. So I know that in the talk, I talked about the first sponsored suffrage parade in 1910. So in 1908, it was an Irish librarian whose name was Maud Malone. And she was a part of a, a more kind of militant group in New York. And she decided that she was going to hold, a, she and a few other women were going to hold a rally um, in Lower Manhattan. I believe they met around Union Square, um, so kind of 14th Street. And they would then march to a women's school. It was a women's trade school on, on East 23rd Street. So it was a short walk. They did not get a permit. They were not granted a permit. The city said, no, we're not sanctioning this. Um, because they wanted to do it on a Sunday. They wanted to allow working women to participate. And New York City had a rule that they would not give permits on Sundays. Maud Malone did it anyways. And she gave her speech and she then walked with a group of, I think it was somewhere around 6,000 people, two to 6,000 people. I know that's a large range, but um, two to 6,000 people who marched to this trade school. And uh, it was photographed and Harriet Stanton Blatch actually saw it. She was there and she watched it go by. Um, and even though it was not sponsored by any official suffrage organization, even though it didn't get a parade, many historians now look back and say, that's the moment where many women started realizing that a parade would work, that that was going to be a workable tactic because it got media attention. It got people talking and they were willing to have people talk about them. That's what they wanted. So it's a really interesting story. Um, there are some photographs online if you wanna go see them. All right, so another question is about the media and was the media generally supportive or opposed to the suffrage movement? Um, it's hard for me to generalize. I would say overall, it's a mixed bag. You do have some papers um, some, some newspapers that are supportive. Um, you have others like the New York Times, for example, that was not supportive um, at the beginning. They eventually come around um, by the time the amendment is passed. Um, but yeah, it's, 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 hard, it's hard to generalize about the media, um, the media landscape and their thoughts on suffrage. It was a, it was really open to debate. And again, there were many, many women who did not want the vote. They were not supportive of the suffrage movement. You know, the anti-suffragists are this really interesting, um, really interesting group of women who are using many of the same arguments about a woman's femininity, a woman's place in the home, um, a woman's ability to do municipal housekeeping, but they didn't feel the need to get the vote to do that. They felt that things were fine as they were. And these included some very prominent um, wealthy women. It wasn't um, you know, many of them overlapped with suffragists and other organizations like um, temperance organizations, those who were pushing to abolish the sale of liquor. So you had women who agreed on, the, uh, on abolishing the sale of liquor, but they didn't agree on if women should have to vote. So um, yeah, it's, it's a really interesting kind of melange of what's going on at this time. Uh, so the last question, which I think is kind of interesting is, what about men? Did they participate in any of these parades? Um, so I'm glad that you asked this question. And I think it's important to recognize allies, right? There, are, there were men who were involved, who supported the women's suffrage movement um, throughout the 19th and the 20th century. Um, there were some men who signed on um, after the women, but they signed on to the, those declaration of sentiments at the Seneca Falls Convention. Um, there were men who helped raise money. Um, there were men's leagues for women's suffrage. And they actually did participate in some of these, um, in particular in New York, which is the area that I know about. They would march in the parades and they marched behind the women. They marched at the end of the line. 
which I think is a really important visual and it's really important symbolism because it's saying women lead this, we support them, we follow their lead, but it's flipping those kind of gendered expectations on their head, which was that men led, men protected the women. And in this case, the men are saying, nope, these women have got it and they're great. And what's really interesting is when going back to this question about media, when you do read the ways in which the media starts reacting to these parades, the media gets more, the newspapers that I read in my dissertation, they get more and more supportive of the women marching and less supportive of the men's lead for women's suffrage participating in these suffrage parades. They start attacking the men as being unmanly or overly feminized. Um, they're heckled and sometimes heckled a lot worse than the women, which I think is like this really interesting kind of gendered, um, you know, it's an interesting way of examining gender roles. But yeah, in, in one of the parades, Upton Sinclair, the very famous writer who um, was, uh, he wrote The Jungle, which uh, exposed uh, the meatpacking industry in Chicago at the beginning of the 20th century. He's marching in one of these parades uh, as part of immensely for women's suffrage, and he gets heckled. Um, so yeah, there were many, many allies of the suffrage movement, um, and it's important to remember them. So yes, so the, the last question is about the ERA. Yes, so um, Mary is pointing out that the ERA has been recently ratified by a few more states um, and that there is currently a push um, or it's pending in Congress to try and extend the ratification date for the ERA. This is a really interesting um, development that is happening right now, you know, history in the making. I highly encourage you to read up on it. Um, but yeah, so the ERA, we almost got there in the 1970s. It was almost ratified, never reached that two thirds threshold. And there is, a, there is a time in which it has to be ratified by. I'm not sure exactly what that period is, but many people argued that because the ERA didn't get to two thirds of the states for ratification by that deadline, it was basically dead. And there is now a renewed push to try and reopen that because enough states have signed on. So again, this is a really fascinating thing to watch. It connects directly back to the suffrage movement. It was started by women who were involved in the suffrage movement, this push for an ERA. So um, yeah, I highly encourage you to look out for more information on the Equal Rights Amendment because it's in the news right now. So that is all of the questions. and. Again, I want you, I want to thank you again for joining me this afternoon. It's my great pleasure to spend Sunday afternoons in conversation with our museum community. If you enjoy today's program, then please mark Sunday, July 24th on your calendars when we will be having a fireside chat about the past and present of Miss Magazine in honor of the magazine's 50th anniversary. Our guests are Kathy Spiller, executive editor of Miss, historian Beverly Guy Sheftal, and historian Amy Farrell. The conversation will be moderated by Carmen Rios. For a full listing of upcoming programs and for registration information, please visit the public programs and events tab at www.womenshistory.org. All events are free, but advanced registration is required. And until next time we meet, please stay safe and healthy. Happy Sunday. <laughs>